You might have noticed that everyone is obsessed with the tools of AI right now, but here is something no one is talking about. The economics of AI is going to freak you out, as the sheer value created from it could reach the current GDP of China by 2030. And that's almost $16 trillion. And one of the most shocking things is that formerly Facebook, now Meta, could lose out on the opportunity of the century. So one thing we know about Zuckerberg is he does not like to lose. While some think he's a robot on the outside, I actually think he's more like McEnroe on the inside. Anything that threatens his empire, he either eats it or renders it useless. Instagram at 30 million users? Acquired. Snapchat builds stories? Copied. Twitter as a text-based social network? Get this, he basically called it a clown car on wheels. And that was before Elon took over. Six months into Elon's acquisition of Twitter, the Bird app gets cloned. So why is one of the most competitive tech billionaires losing the AI war? To understand this better, we need to go back to the early days of Facebook and the tech industry in the 2000s. Let's dig in. So before the term big tech became common jargon, there was a new word thrown around the tech industry. Disruption. Siebel Systems, a $6 billion enterprise software company which would sell CD-ROMs to sales guys for managing their customer database, was getting crushed by a company built by a guy named Mark Benioff. Mark simply put the whole software infrastructure on the cloud with his company Salesforce. No CD-based installations, reduced training costs, and a fraction of software setup cost. Not only did he disrupt ease of use, he even disrupted traditional marketing. He once had girls wearing bikinis skating outside a Siebel Systems conference with placards saying no software to acquire users for his company. His startup, Salesforce, would disrupt Siebel and eat its market share in a matter of six years. Siebel eventually got acquired, and this was just the beginning of a major trend. Google burst out into the tech scene with its PageRank search engine algorithm. From a time when a couple of PhD students, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, were willing to sell their company for a million dollars, they had come a long way. When you searched for something, their algorithm ranked the website with the highest traffic backlinks while weighing relevance and context. And to top it off, it had a great spam filter cleaning out all the crap from the search results. In a span of 14 years, by 2012, Google was handling 100 billion searches per month and had gotten to a market cap of $230 billion. Meanwhile, Jeff Bezos' Amazon had launched a website selling books for rentals and had eyes set on becoming the biggest e-commerce site on the planet. They did this on the back of AWS, which would be their crown jewel, whose profits would pay for Amazon's expansion as it spread its tentacles from selling books to selling everything online. Legal, of course. Microsoft was the old-school tech company at this point, but still very relevant to the times. Their core business, the PC and workplace software Microsoft Office, was still growing year over year. Bill Gates led Microsoft from a small project with co-founder Paul Allen to the most valuable company on the planet in the early 2000s, making Bill the richest guy in the world. And then came along Mark Zuckerberg a Harvard sophomore who built Facebook's first version in his dorm room, allegedly a stolen idea from the Winklewoss brothers. I mean, had he not stolen it, and let's say the brothers had built it themselves, would Facebook become what it is today? Without Zuck's tenacity? I think not. By 2012, his social media company had become worth $300 billion and had already acquired the next fastest growing social media platform, Instagram. He was unstoppable. So now we have, by 2010, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Facebook on top of the leaderboard when it came to software shops. They became platform companies on top of which businesses were growing. Creator economy and gig economy flourished. And this is still the early days, of course. We will talk about the antitrust issues related to them some other time. Big Tech, as the companies were now called, had fattened up their market caps to a combined trillion dollars. And with fierce, brilliant founders at the wheel, they were not slowing down. Every single one of them was acquiring startups not only to buy growth, but also to stay ahead of the curve. They didn't want to get lazy while they had gotten fat, 
and this meant staying at the bleeding edge of technology, whether it was synthetic biology, VR, or AI. So what is AI and how did it evolve to become what it is today? To begin with, AI is not a new concept or a new invention, but complex math that builds from computer science, linguistics, psychology, neuroscience, and ethics. Alan Turing built the Turing machine, a first-of-its-kind general-purpose computer which was designed to hack the Nazi ciphers during World War II. In the 1950s, John McCarthy coined the term artificial intelligence at the Dartmouth College Conference. It wasn't until 2006 that the Geoffrey Hinton introduced the concept of deep learning neural networks, which was considered a significant milestone in AI. Neural networks and reinforcement neural networks became quite popular in the 2000s, going into the late 2010s, close to 2020. Taking inspiration from the paper Attention is All You Need by Vaswani et al., the Transformer model became the next iteration in AI, as it was expected to be better at parallel processing and take data from all parts of the inputs at once, called the attention mechanism, as opposed to sequential processing in recurrent neural networks. AI could theoretically surpass general human intelligence, creating original research, discoveries, and transform the world indefinitely. Well, Nikola Tesla was also working on moonshot projects like long-distance wireless electricity. But even if he did invent them, it would all still be theory until applications would make his discoveries real. The journey of AI overflowing into real-world applications would also be something similar, long and arduous. Robert Moore in his prophetic statement in the 60s stated that the number of transistors in a chip would double every year. Not only would this statement become real, but its ancillary statement cost and performance of transistors and computer chips would improve two times year over year, turned out to be true. TSMC played a big role in making this happen, crushing compute costs and making our devices smaller. In the early 2010s, NVIDIA's chips were initially used for graphics, and gaming were now being considered for AI research and applications. With search, shopping, social media, and workplace enterprise software conquered Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook started pouring billions into AI projects now that the foundational infrastructure made AI possible. Post-2010, Google and Amazon were both working on natural language processing and image processing with projects like Google Assistant, Amazon Alexa, and Google Lens. Google had earlier acquired British AI company DeepMind to support their AI research and had already made waves with their AI winning the AlphaGo competition in 2016. Microsoft invested early in AI-driven products with Bing in 2009, followed by Azure Machine Learning and Cognitive Services by 2016, and then Microsoft Teams in 2017. Facebook, as it was called, took a different approach. They took an academic strategy creating a lab called FAIR, Fundamental AI Research, in as early as 2013, building a team of scientists who worked on projects like PyTorch, predictive models in 2017 to building protein machine learning models after 2020. Chat with me. Now, although we had applications in AI, the human AI interface was still unconquered. How would the tech giants get humans to use AI products while still giving an incredible experience? Enter Sam Altman. Stanford dropout, named as one of the entrepreneurs to look out for by Paul Graham, the founder of Y Combinator, he and his team worked on his company OpenAI and built quietly for years. Co-founded with Elon Musk, they had a falling out, but we'll get into that in some other video. Sam and team had now built out the latest iteration in AI tech, which was GPT-3. Inspired by the paper from Google Brain like we already mentioned, OpenAI and team made this real. The interface he chose was so simple, a child could use it. It was basically chat. People who want to make themselves sound smart now call it prompt. There's even terms like prompt engineering now. But essentially, he created a chat interface to talk to AI. He launched Dolly to mixed reviews. Although still a great product, the images from Dolly would not have the clarity of Stable Diffusion and Midjourney's latest versions. But a strain of a new habit was formed. People were now quite comfortable with the idea of asking an AI to do something, generate something out of thin air. OpenAI launched ChatGPT based on GPT-3 in March 2023. It was a resounding success. 
The product got 100 million users in a span of two months. AI assistants like Google Assistant and Amazon Alexa had been here for a while. But see, behaviors matter. They simply couldn't garner the engagement levels of ChatGPT. People were tinkering with it for hours a day. The media covered it like none other. There was reportedly a red alert at Google. You see, Google had also been working on a large language model called Palm 2, but they were quick to respond to the clear trend, the chat user interface, and launched Bard. Released as an in-development chatbot, it opened up to mixed reactions. Palm 2 LLM had 100 billion parameters in the model. Microsoft, on the other hand, had played it smart. They invested early into OpenAI and now have a 49% stake since 2019. Microsoft chatbot Bing has access to GPT-4, the latest version of ChatGPT, which is reportedly a trillion parameters while OpenAI also launched GPT-4. AI loser? If you own a company that is worth $300 billion, which Meta was in 2015, every decision you make costs millions, even billions if it is about addressing a growing market. Zuckerberg bet on the next generation of social media, the metaverse, expected to dissolve boundaries within the physical and real world, with each action you take now simulated in the virtual universe. But with AI, Zuck took an academic approach by hiring research scientist Yan Li Kun as early as 2013 to advance AI. Li Kun created a research-driven AI strategy, as opposed to utility or commercially driven. Meta attracted research scientists over engineers, focused on the architecture of AI, as opposed to using the major trend in utilitarian AI, which was LLM transformers. Even the server infrastructure Meta invested in was research-focused as opposed to efficiency and scale. Certain Meta AI researchers defected from this approach and created projects like OPT2 LLM and Llama. OPT2 LLM helped create BlenderBot 3, a chatbot released in August 2022 which opened to certain negative reviews with issues concerning misinformation and racist comments. Llama had issues of its own. Released as an open source model, it somehow got leaked onto GitHub, helping several startups to build a chatbot of their own. The research approach and focus on Metaverse had caused almost a third of their AI talent to quit. So with the infrastructure, research strategy, had Meta lost the AI war? Here's the fascinating part. Meta is losing the AI war, but it's almost intentional. One of their strategic reasons is safety. Well, his safety reason stems from the fact that Meta has had a not-so-perfect relationship with the government and with the general public. Cambridge Analytics controversy in 2015, the questions about the 2016 elections, and the 5 billion fines slapped in the EU. Zuck definitely wants to rebrand his company image. The other reason is strategy. Zuck thinks that the AI foundational architecture with Transformers isn't set in stone and possibly thinks there's more research coming in the nuts and bolts of AI models. Also, Zuck has 3 billion users across Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram. That's almost half the world. He believes in utilizing AI products he will build to make the metaverse faster, seamless, and closer to real experience. Whether his counterintuitive strategy pays off in the long run, we will just have to wait and see. If you thought tapping into trends is interesting, consumer behavior economics, that's a mouthful, is also fascinating. Do watch how she became the youngest billionaire in the world by hacking consumer behavior.